Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well. Today I'm going to speak about uh, um, Gilead by Marilyn Robinson, a book that won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in uh, 2005. I really hope that I can be clear enough and do it some justice, because I really love this book. Although it's a work of literary fiction, this is one of the very best books about God and the Christian faith that I've ever read. Uh, from a conceptual point of view, it achieves what some really good theology books do, uh, and then it actually surpasses it by pointing out how presumptuous it is for anyone to be conclusive about faith and to judge anyone else's faith. Let me try to explain. Gilead is written as a letter from a 76-year-old Congregationalist preacher, his name is Pastor Ames, to his seven year old son, very young son. Ames uh, has been given only a few weeks to live by his doctor, and uh, he writes down his thoughts in the hope that his son will read them in the future. This is really a, a fictional vehicle for the author to offer a superb meditation on life and death and faith. For example, here is a brief paragraph from the first pages. If you're a grown man when you read this, it is my intention for this letter that you will read it then. I'll have been gone a long time. I'll know most of what there is to know about being dead, but I'll probably keep it to myself. That seems to be the way of things. Um, this rare thing happened to me while I was reading Gilead. At the very first moment, um, I couldn't stand it. Uh, Ames sounded uh, very self-serving. Um, his account of his own life was a little bit um, selfish and there was no real tension. Once I was about halfway through, when uh, another character arrives on the scene, the novel suddenly acquires the contrast that I felt it really needed. Um, I started to flat out love it and I loved it even more by the end because it's really a book full of light and hope, such uh, positivity that resonates with me in an almost perfect way. Initially, I couldn't stand the main character. As I said, his attitude being, I'm so happy for myself that I have you, my son, but I'm really, really sorry for you that I'm not leaving you any money at all because I'm actually 77 years old and broke. As if these two things were just accidents that he could not avoid at all. Um, not to talk about his idolizing of his eccentric grandpa who used to bully his wife into giving away their money and possessions to anyone who asked. Just ask and I'll give you anything. Generous people are a great blessing, but sometimes in my experience I've seen a kind of exaggerated generosity, which for some people is often another way of putting themselves upon a pedestal uh, to feel superior and uh, even try to dominate others. Uh, so I thought that was the case with this fictional character, with John Ames. But what I couldn't understand at the beginning was that Robinson is actually using this rather unremarkable human situation simply as a platform to take off from and elevate her novel to a much higher level in the second part. Gilead is a book so unbelievably full of depth, wisdom and poetry that by the end of it I was completely floored. It also contains a lot of Christian theology and explicit and implicit references to the Bible, in particular to the parable of the prodigal son. But none of that is presented in a preachy or academic tone. And uh, um, certainly you couldn't say that this is a book for Christians in a certain way, because the tone is really open and universal. For example, the book never mentions Jesus or his miracles even once. So in, in his balanced and slow-paced letter-style monologue, uh, John Ames, the main character, brings up atheism, for example, Feuerbach, Hegel, Calvin, and other really fine minds. His, th his thoughts feel really genuine coming from his heart, and I'm completely sure that uh, um, this is a way for Robinson to express what she really feels and thinks through the mouth of her character, of her main character. And I'm sure she gave this matters a lot of thoughts and study and selfishly admit that 
the fact that her thoughts on religion align perfectly well with mine, uh, because I'm Catholic, uh, helped a lot. Uh, the author comes from a congre congregational church, but that makes zero difference to me. Uh, above all, I've uh, always noticed that in literature it's so rare to find great depth and great positivity mixed in together in the same book or in the same artist or writer or, or person. It's much more common to find either depth and desperation or uh, happy superficiality. And that's what makes Gilead such a treasure. Uh, I noticed that some reviewers found Gilead boring because there is no plot. And that's not exactly the case, but I can certainly understand that if you're looking for a plot-driven book, this is not uh, the book for you at all. Uh, Gilead is much larger than its characters, is much larger than its plot, and then the events that are being narrated. And as I mentioned, um, Marilyn Robinson used the vehicle of fiction to express some really deep and heartfelt points about faith, about life and religion. I think her greatest achievement in Gilead is that she succeed in painting Christianity at its best. In other words, Christianity as a living, real thing, as opposed to a bunch of rules and dogmas. Christianity as a way of living, with all its messiness, contradictions, failures and struggles, but also Christianity as seen from a very wise, positive and self-aware point of view. In fact, I, I found many thoughts and ideas in this book that seem to come straight from St. Augustine, for example, whom personally I consider Christianity at, at its best in terms of um, philosophy and theology when it comes to thinking in, uh, in the Christian history. So this uh, old narrator, John Ames, is, he's never trying to convince his son or the reader about the validity of Christianity. He's never trying to really uh, be assertive. When he's writing about skepticism, um, for example, he says the following. Young people from my own flock come to me with a copy of La Nose or L'Immoraliste, uh, flamox by the possibility of unbelief. And they are attracted to it and they want me to defend religion and they want me to give them proofs. I just won't do it. It only confirms them in their skepticism, because nothing true can be say about, said about God from a posture of defense. So the topic of self-righteousness, um, in addition to this, is also another central theme. theme. Um, here's another really interesting quote from the book. People of any degree of religious sensitivity are always vulnerable to the accusation that their consciousness or their understanding does not attain to the highest standard of the standards of the faith, because that is always true of everyone. But if the awkwardness and falseness and failure of religion are interpreted to mean there is no core of truth in it, then people are disabled from trusting their thoughts, their expression of belief, their understanding and even from believing in the essential dignity of their and their neighbors' endlessly flawed experience of belief. It seems to me there is less meanness in atheism by a good measure than in religious self-righteousness. So Robinson is a novelist and essayist. She wrote many essays about theology, John Calvin, about U.S. history, about politics. Um, during her career as a teacher, she even had a student, uh, she, she even had uh, Debbie Foster Wallace as a student at Amherst College. And uh, uh, here I have an, ex an excerpt from uh, an interview with Marilyn Robinson. The interviewer is asking, is Gilead on some level a novel about being Christian, about what it mean, what it might mean to live a Christian life? And uh, Marilyn Robinson replies, I think I can guardedly say yes. The fact is, being who I am, my definition of human life is perhaps not readily universalized, but I hope that it is not a narrow view of human life itself. I don't have the feeling that people need to be Christian in order to understand what the novel is and what it means and so on. 
um, to recognize it's about father-son relations or parent-child relations. Um, in the Gospel, of course, that's the major metaphor for the situation of a human being in the world relative to God. I think that in using that metaphor, the New Testament is appealing to something that people profoundly and universally know, that what it is to love a child and what it is to love a parent. So that's a big, big subject in the book. And obviously you can find the rest of the interview at a link that I'm uh, posting below my video. Uh, and also a video of the author reading the last pages of the book, um, if, you're, if you're interested in, uh, in seeing that. In conclusion, I am uh, going to quote the very last line of the book. Um, feel free to stop watching if you like, but I can tell you that they're really not a spoiler, since the fictional author of these letters says he's going to die from the very beginning, so there's no surprise in, uh, in the last pages. This is his... Uh, farewell to his son and his last wish. I love this town. I think sometimes of going into the ground here as a last, last wild gesture of love. I too will smolder away the time until the great and general incandescence. I'll pray that you grow up a brave man in a brave country. I will pray you find a way to be useful. I'll pray and then I will sleep. To be brave and useful. That's, in my opinion, something that we can and we should aspire to every single day. Thanks for watching. I'm looking forward to hearing your comments in, uh, and reading your comments in, uh, uh, below this video. Uh, and uh, please like the video if you liked it. Thanks a lot.